Good morning and welcome to the AIS session. Um, on behalf of SENSE and Eodin, I would like to first thank our speakers for accepting our invitation and for their great contribution to offer you some great content covering various aspects of AIS. Uh, I would also like to thank you for picking the AIS session among a large choice of topics. Um, this session, um, the way it's organized, will not have Q&A, uh, but you will get a chance to ask questions to the speakers later out of band, uh, we will send the contact info and we'll make sure that you can actually reach them directly. The idea for this session um, was to put AIS in the spotlight um, because it gains more traction in many businesses um, and, and it can improve uh, and create values in, in many, uh, many verticals. Uh, and we witness that every day in, in our daily activities. Um, I'm Matthias Herberts. I'm the co-founder of Sense. Um, Sense is a company focused on providing tools for working with sensor data. Um, and we teamed up, teamed up with Eodin. Um, and Yan Gishu, CEO of Eodin, will say a few words. Many thanks, Matthias, for the, the intro. So I won't have to add so many things to your to speech. Uh, for one reason, your, your English is perfect. And it would be more for, for comfortable for the audience to to listen to you, uh, and uh, I will have the opportunity by the end of the, present, the, by the, end of the session to present our activity. So just uh, a word to say that I'm very pleased to co-organize co this session with you, Matthias, and uh, so take the floor, please. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, and now, without further ado, uh, since we actually started late, um, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Stefan. Uh, Stefan Pilmeyer from Ayala, who will talk about the history and the future of AIS. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthias. I try to share my screen. Uh-huh, good. And that should be this one. Okay. And here I'm going into presentation mode. Mm -hmm. So you should see my presentation, Matthias. Yep. Is that good. right? Thank you very much. So thank you very much for having the opportunity to talk here today about AIS. Vides and beyond, I'm saying. So now I can see I have, in fact, a little bit in the way here. I have the Zoom window. So now you should be able to read everything. <laughs> my name is Stefan Pielmeier. I'm actually working for Sternula. Um, we will look a little bit into that further later on. And I'm representing as well Ayala here today. So let's go into the presentation. Next slide. Yes. So who am I? Um, I'm also the project leader of the Marriott project. Uh, that is a project looking into actually using the new way of AIS VDES. We will see that a bit later. I'm the chairman of the Ayala ENAF uh, Working Group 3 Comms. So we are working with the standardization of AIS VDES and yeah, more smaller topics. These two are using most of our time. I'm participating uh, also at standardization um, at ITU Working Party 5B for VDES. And I've been working in Trane and Trane. Some of you might have seen the equipment on board of ships called Sailor. So this is experience from building VHF, MFHF, GNSS, Navtex, and AIS equipment. What is Sternula then? Sternula is Denmark's first commercial satellite operator and um, we try to be the first mover in providing global commercial VDE SAT coverage uh, to authorities and service providers, um, meaning that we can transport data to ships using VDIS equipment in the future. <clears throat> so let's look into AIS, that's why we are here. Um, we need to start a little bit before the digital age. History of vessel identification starts, in fact, with flags. Um, and that was in the 1500s, 1600s. Um, royal colors were used to identify the country of a ship's origin. Um, when the number of ships um, grew, 
uh, about uh, 50 to 60 years later, whatever, in the middle of the 1700, uh, 1600s, already some flag books were produced, identifying ships, helping identify ships, and so on. So, um, important point was 1817, when the code of Frederick Marriott um, was the first attempt to formalize signals at sea. Um, also a kind of book, I guess. And um, then into the 19th, into the 20th century, we see that 1968 is in fact, as far as I, my information goes, the first SOLAS uh, standard that comes into force with uh, the former name for IMO, with resolution A80, the International Code of Signals. So that's the first time uh, when we really had a, a written and, and clear standard for how flags and signals are used to identify ships. However, about the start of the 22nd century in 1900, there uh, happened what we today call a disruption. And let's see what that disruption was. Yeah, of course, we probably already guessed, right? Uh, this disruption was radio, radio technology. Um, the, at about year 1900, the first mari marine telegraph stations were installed on ships and everybody used Morse code at the time. Um, but there was no courage requirement. And then something happened. Um, the Titanic event uh, happened, the Titanic sank in 1912. Um, that immediately created a, a wave of change, uh, an awareness in the maritime community that, community that we need carriage requirements and radio watch keeping. So just having a... Uh, a CV transmitter on board doesn't help you. There also need to be somebody listening to what you're transmitting. And that became quite soon mandatory. I don't have the precise year. Oh, sorry. Um, and the ITU introduced call signs. In the beginning, that was only a two-letter country code. So that didn't really identify the ship yet. But... Um, Later on, they started uh, providing a five-letter code or six-letter code, I think it was. So then it started really to be possible to identify a ship if the ship uh, transmitted its identification by using of, of shortwave um, Morse code. In the 1970, the Morse code was still uh, used and was the way to, to send out a distress. And first in 1988, the IMO established the GMDSS, what we today know as the red buttons in the bridge of the ships uh, where it's written distress and where you just can press the button uh, for about five seconds and then you get a distress signal sent out through all kind of different communication methods ensuring that uh, your um, there is somebody listening to that distress. However, in the 1950s, there was another disruption. So let's look at that one because we still don't have any automatic identification of ships. So still there was communication necessary. And in, okay, in case of a distress, of course, you would have that from 1988, but uh, you don't want to make a distress every time you want to identify a ship. Uh, so we need something else. Well, now we really get into vessel identification because 1950s gave us the radar. And uh, the first radars installed at shore uh, were used immediately to assist traffic management, identifying ships. However, uh, the ship's identification as such was not transmitted automatically by the radar. You only get a, a small dot somewhere on a screen. So that's a distance more or less and, um, and an, a heading from shore. So they needed to use VHF, in fact, and the call sign of the ship in order to identify the ship. And that needed to be done repeatedly in order to know which of the dots is which ship. So that was not so convenient, but already much better than before. 
Um, in the and then things really start to go very quick. In the 1950 to 60, radar ship installations were coming quite soon. Not at all for identification relevant, as these were only used to avoid collisions with land or with other ships. Uh, but in the 80s, we already see that digitalization came into the radar systems and that was adding some help. Still no automatic identifi identification. Um, the radio direction finder, however, was used optionally to be an overlay on the radar display. So you could see when a ship was transmitting and telling you their call sign, you could see in which angle the ship was uh, transmitting from on your radar screen. So you could identify the dot of the ship much more conveniently. And then you could tag that dot and then this tag would follow the ship as long as there was an echo from the ship. However, when the echo was lost for a few minutes, you needed to redo that operation. So still no out and automatic identification. In parallel, in the 80s, um, there started to be a development on radar transponders and beacons. And these proposals were discussed at uh, IMCO at the time. Uh, today, this is called IMO. And these are basically based on a response signal from the ship to the shore radar signal, helping to identify the ship. And in 1986, we had a resolution 423 on radar beacons and transponders from IMO, um, giving you a recommendation on how to make such an installation. It's very complex antennas and a ship-to-ship -ship identification, which could be useful for anti-collision, was not possible at that time. So also here, radar is good, but it doesn't really give us what we have today. So something needed to happen. And that happened in 1986. In 1986, a Swedish uh, person called Benny Pettersson from the Swedish Maritime Authorization uh, Administration um, specified, in fact, the requirements for the VHF-based system to exchange identification of ships. It was not the AIS. Um, however, it was the first, at least documented in the books that I'm using, the first documented idea of doing an AIS kind of system. Um, it was uh, only produced for tests and was never really deployed as, a, as an operational system, only some testing was run. Um, but there were then in the coming years, things went really fast because all administration wanted to have some kind of AIS equipment or what we today, CSAIS. Um, I tried to list all the different abbreviations that came up at the time. Uh, I'm sure it's only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it seemed like everybody at the time was looking into that problem and there came tens of proposals to IMO, to Ayala to ITU and the problem in fact was to uh, find out which of the systems was the one that could be made, could be promoted as the one system. And you could say 10 years later in 1996, uh, ITU Working Party 8C um, drafted for the first time what today is the document called M1371, which is the AIS standard of ITU. And things went really fast. Just a year later, WRC, the World Radio Conference, assigned the necessary frequencies for such a system. Sorry, uh, that's the channels AIS1 and AIS2 because the IMO requested it. And then there was started an Ayala special working group on AIS. And this group um, kind of continues this uh, work from that very first draft. And in December 2000, IMO approved in, in a document MSC 99, no, that's the MSC 99 meeting, 
um, that from 2002 on, all ships that are heavier than 500 tons or, well, what we know is SOLAS ships today, that all SOLAS ships have to carry an AIS. 2002, it started with new build ships and then in the coming years, it would be a carriage requirement for all um, yeah, all, um, all other ships, also old ships. Okay, so now we have AIS. Since uh, year 2000, uh, we also know it's a carriage requirement. What, what is AIS? Um, and I think IEC did a great job in telling us with their performance standards what AIS is, what this is used for, because AIS as such is only a transmission standard at ITU, so you can use it for a lot of different applications. In the start, um, we had the what we today call class A AIS. That's for the solar ships. That was the first priority. Um, just uh, a few years later, IEC um, developed or described what a class B AIS should be and how this should work and is tested. Um, then uh, in 2004 to 2007, base stations came, Aton stations came, repeater stations came. And now these days we have AIS SART, AIS SAR airborne and um, main overboard devices and EPIRP AIS is uh, according to my sources still considered working progress. Some of that is already standardized and working, but this is coming. So AIS is clearly under development. It has millions of applications. I think we are not yet, uh, we have not yet seen uh, all its uses. Um, so it's a very, very, very useful tool. Uh, we have created and, and it was not only Ayala, it was many people, ITU especially, uh, was always very good in cooperating with Ayala in making a standard out of it. So this was a great piece of work. So what happens now? Well, um, AIS is technically speaking capable of exchanging digital information. That's something we need. Um, today we use it what I call static and dynamic navigational ship parameters. So this is position, this is speed, it's heading, course over ground. These are all dynamic, but we also have a lot of static information like type of cargo, number of passengers, national, state, whatever. Call sign obviously is a part of that as well. Very important. <laughs> Actually, maybe the most important one. Um, Good. It also can transport application specific messages. That's not, I would dare to say that's not used that much. It's used a lot, but that's not that visible. Most people think about position and identification, but you also can do two way uh, message communication. However, that is not used that wide because these messages are very much limited in size. It's just about a kilobyte. And um, the capacity of the AIS channels are also very limited. We will come to see that. Well, today, that means that about 220,000 terminals, and that's not only ships, it's vessels, it's atons. It's like you find AIS devices everywhere. Um, are visible today. And in fact, I used uh, our colleagues here from, from marine traffic.com in order to verify that yesterday, and I think yesterday it was 219,000. And the numbers are rising very quick, in fact. So it's a very interesting market to be in. And I'm sorry, uh, Maritime uh, Connectivity guys, I wanted to show this picture. I hope it's a okay cool for you uh, that I. Uh, marine traffic.com uh, uh, make some advertisement for you because it's a wonderful tool. Uh, you can sit there the whole evening and move the dots. Uh, yeah, five. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, you can see the dots move around. So it's, it's incredible what AIS has given us together with the satellites and all the receiver stations, of course, to get this picture. We know where every ship in the world is today. And the interesting thing is everybody thinks about planes as the most safest thing in the world and they probably are but you can't actually achieve the same with planes because we don't have all the satellites up yet to 
show where they are. Well, this is progress. Uh, it's, it's going on, but for the ship, shipping world, this was first. So that's really great, a great tool. So we have talked a lot about the benefits of AIS, anti-collision, coordination between ships and so on, fleet monitoring, very important. Um, however, it's just a limited data exchange and um, remote monitoring of, of equipment out there is also used a lot by maritime authorities, by fishermen who want to ensure that the net is still behind the ship and things like that. Yes. So there must also be something wrong with something good and that's uh, the AIS issues. Well, slowly we find out that it's not secure, so it can be disturbed or spoofed. Anybody can program any MMSI on any AIS and transmit with it. Um, so, and the position is not secured. Uh, you can spoof the position rather easily, I would say, as an engineer at least. So that's the whole security thing that we uh, today discuss. Um, at the same time, uh, IMO has identified some e-navigation services and these navigation services require much more data and AIS cannot transmit, uh, transport that data for us because we only have two channels and they are already quite crowded in many places uh, at the world. So what are we doing in IALA um, and around? Well, in 2008, IMO has defined this e-navigation strategy for communications. It says that we need an infrastructure providing authorized seamless information transfer on board of ship, between ships, between ship and shore and authorities and other parties with many related benefits. And in parentheses, AIS can't do that. And in 2008, IALA started uh, it as part of the ENAF committee work to design uh, VDES and make a communication standard out of it and input it as a general rule to ITU so ITU can standardize that. Yes, um, and that went on and in 2019 we got the frequencies. Well, in 15 we got the frequencies for the channels and in 19 we got assigned as well satellite operation channels. And what is VDES? VDES is a very flexible way to transport bigger digital data. Data rates about 100 kilobit per second. And it's uh, meant to be used for navigational and safety related communications, but don't expect video streaming from it, okay? It's not internet. So you can connect uh, nearly everything with each other, ships with ships, ships with smart boys. And the interesting thing is you also have a satellite component, um, which is making uh, the future of AIS, which is VDES, uh, very interesting. So expect VDES to come into your AIS equipment on board of the ships um, within the next two years. It's probably an option in the start where you have to make a little tick and pay a few more euros. I would expect that in five to 10 years from now, it's just the AIS has become a VDES because AIS is part of VDES. Um, it's very attractive because it's a global standard. Every ship will be equipped with it. Uh, it's very likely to become a solar, solar carriage requirement and the security is, is much higher um, than with internet connections. And like AIS, it's cheap because you probably don't need a SIM card or anything to use it globally. Okay, time has gone. We are quite far with VDES. I can tell you standardization is very close to that we have something out of ITU that is actually usable. And the test standard is already begun to uh, be developed and major equipment producers are starting to make their products ready. Um, where you can help to make VDES a future is help us that VDES becomes a carriage requirement in Sula's chapter five. And you can participate in IALA, ENAF committee, and in the Maritime Connectivity Consortium to help end-to-end -end connectivity of services to ship equipment or other equipment in the future. Yes, well, I have a few more slides, but I think we don't have so much time. 
satellite network. We are building a satellite network. About 70 satellites by 2028 should give us global coverage. So with your AIS equipment in 2028, you have global digital communications around the whole world. Um, I guess these slides will be shared. So here you have all the sources I have used. I want especially to highlight for the history of AIS, a new book of Ayala called AIS in a history, historic perspective by Wim van der Heiden. It came out this year and it's very interesting reading because all the politics behind and so on is really great. Thank you very much, Matthias, for my time. And thank you, everybody, for listening. <laughs> well, thank you, Stefan. That that was really, really insightful. Um, having a, a great tour of, of AIS and, and the future. Um, our next speaker is is Simon van den Dries from Spire Maritime. Uh, we'll talk about the value of AIS uh, in, in various applications. Uh, Simon, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning. I'm a little bit far away. I'll try to get in here. Good morning from Luxembourg. Uh, let me share my screen. If that works. Um, yes, can you see my screen? Yes, great. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for organizing this. It's always a bit... Um, new for me to have these virtual conferences and not being able to meet you guys face to face and to talk with Stefan in the corridor, which I would like to do one day, Stefan, we need to, uh, to talk further. And I enjoyed your presentation very much. Um, VDS is definitely on our radar. I'm not going to talk about it, but I can assure you that we are working on it uh, very hard to see what kind of role Spire will play. And luckily with these things, I mean, they take a little bit of time, so we have time as well to uh, to adjust and prepare ourselves. But I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Spire Global is, what Spire Maritime is, what maritime data is. I also have a little bit of history, but not as detailed as Stefan did. And um, I think the title of uh, the presentation was the value of data. There is quite a bit of discussion around data. Um, having data is one thing, but making sure that it solves your problems is another thing. And uh, I think it's our responsible uh, responsibility as a data provider to, um, to make sure that people actually extract the value out of it and are able to solve problems. So my name is uh, Simon Vendries. I'm the general manager of Spire Maritime um, and um, based in Luxembourg. A few facts. Um, we are basically a data service provider that um, have their own satellites in orbit at 550 kilometers altitude. We scan the globe and when we scan it, we scan the weather, we scan aircrafts and we scan vessels as well as the entire atmosphere around it. We have about 225 employees, we have six offices and we've got now 95 satellites in orbit. We are planning to be something around 130, 140 next year. The satellites are called LEMURS, which stands for Low Earth Multi-Use Receiver. And that's a quite appropriate term because we are at 550 kilometers altitude and we do multiple uses to detect all of these things that I just mentioned. We have a spread around the globe. These are um, the offices with the uh, estimated amount of people and the red logos are our ground stations, um, which makes it quite unique um, in terms of Spire and the value chain. Um, and that is this slide, I'm going a little bit back and forward, because we control the entire value chain from designing uh, the satellites to bring the satellites up together with our launch partners, being it Allianz Pass, being it Elon Musk. Um, once they are in space, we start to mine the data, uh, we run our ground stations, we process the data, we augment the data with third-party data, we clean it, and then it's up to our customers to refine it, to productize it, and ultimately to deliver business improvements. Um, because that's what our customers use it for. They actually want to minimize risks, optimize profits, save time, save money, increase reliability, increase safety. That's ultimately what all of this brought forward. And the beauty about, uh, or the uniqueness about Spire is the fact that we control the entire. So satellite design, if we're looking at VDS, we do this in-house. 
We have um, satellite design engineers in Singapore and Glasgow um, that are following all of these developments and we will be the first one to actually control the entire part and you can see the benefits uh, for that. These are a few logos in there. Again, marine traffic is there. I mean, they are all over that uh, as well. They are using our data. There's a few others, but we have a few, several hundreds of logos right now that we are doing. But um, uh, I think that the beauty of this is that we have um, large international organizations like NASA and ESA. We have uh, very well-known maritime applications, and we also have other customers, um, in, including EODIN and um, Ericsson and lots of lots of others. Um, this is an overview of all the data that we are doing. Maritime is one important part and we have been organized in different business units in order to communicate and better with the market and to accelerate faster with our roadmaps. But apart from that, we are collecting aviation data, um, agricultural weather data, and ultimately we do space as a service, which is a specialized payload uh, that we can bring on, on our lemurs for somebody that wants to test something, to measure something, or for example, to do a in-demonstration VDES orbit. Um, we all do that um, as space as a service or orbital services as we call it right now. Um, this is interesting. Uh, we have a slightly uh, more uh, romantic slide um, on the history in there, which is um, it started with a cup of coffee um, when the sailors came in in 1750, where captains came in and talked about the stories of boats that came from London um, to China and from the Americas to China. And at that time, coffee was actually uh, quite a rare thing and um, the more affordable people in London went to Edward Lloyd's coffee house to drink the coffee and at the same time they were discussing which vessel was coming from which destination and where it would go to and before you knew there were actually insurance companies going to that coffee house and uh, trying to sell their insurances towards the vessels uh, there were the bankers financing the vessels and the cargo all in that coffee house and Edward started to listening and write down his list of all the vessels coming in that he heard in there. He published that list and more than 250 years later, Lloyd's list still exists of that. So that is how important it is. And it's actually still what we are still doing. It was the age of chit chat. And obviously as uh, Stefan explained, the moment that standardization really comes in um, and the, the pivotal turning point was the definition of the IMO standard in 1996 and then the introduction as you see from Stefan, 1998, uh, 2002, when it was really there. Standardization is always um, the enabler for effective global communication. And then it took about 10 years to um, map the coastlines with uh, terrestrial AIS receivers. And from that moment on, the transparent area began. And we could find uh, most of the vessels in particularly in 2012-13, when um, a few governments, including Orpcom, started to launch the first thing on the satellite, um, it really lit up the entire globe with it. And now in 2020, going forward, we are in the data age. I mean, it's almost a given that we see that screen with all the vessels. And now it's about uh, better let the data work for you. Um, make that data advantage and let data make the decisions on what you want to do. We call that uh, prescriptive data, um, whereby you define the likely outcome, which is, for example, uh, reduced fuel cost in your shipping voyage. And you let the data, the weather data, the, the ocean currents, let tell basically the um, defined route in order to get the appropriate outcome. So what we are doing here in terms of maritime data is decades old. It just gets better and it just gets extremely more powerful if you know how to use it, if you have the right data, and if you know how to extract value out of the data. This is what it looks like, uh, 100 million uh, maritime AES messages per day. These are collected by hours one. I see um, the colleague from Marine Traffic having a similar background in there. I'm assuming this is uh, the Marine Traffic data in there, but this is, I think it's beautiful. If you look at these kind of data that we are just collecting with our satellites, including like Amazon River, um, we go everywhere. Our satellites fly in 45 minutes from the North Pole to the South Pole. They detect anything um, and they will um, put these beautiful pictures. 
For Spire maritime, um, maritime data is the combination of uh, location, historic location, future location, vessel, all the related information to that, cargo, which we are doing as well, and weather data. These are the four things that consist of our uh, Spire maritime data. And this is what we are quite unique in as well to put that uh, together. Now, obviously, there are a lot of data providers, and um, there are a few of these uh, comics which have said, <laughs> I'll find that your data is bigger than mine, and you have this discussion. It is, people that have been in the data business must admit that it is quite a challenge to discuss about data and to compare data and to make sure um, what data do you use for what purpose. Therefore, when we talk about data, it is very important to take into account the value of data. And for us, the value for data, if it's solving your problem, or in other words, if it's fit for its intended uses in operations, decision making and planning. And people have heard maybe of the five V's um, or the four V's and we've extended that a little bit. But when you look at data, ultimately, uh, particularly also for AIS data, we look at volume, variety, velocity. Yes, can you still hear me? Yeah, you're back. Yep, you're back. I'm, I'm back actually from my other mobile phone and I'm afraid I cannot continue with the, uh, with the slides, but that is okay. Uh, there are a few other things. So I was talking about the data value um, that we are, uh, are bringing in. Um, there's a few more things that I want to, to highlight. Um, one of that is um, our maritime weather, um, which we are um, delivering uh, by measuring um, the atmospheric columns over the oceans. Um, we have uh, about 10,000 profiles, atmospheric profiles over the ocean per day. Um, and that results in um, being as a unique provider for open ocean weather data. This was one of my slides that I cannot show, but hopefully you'll see that later. Um, we have done a test with um, professional sailors uh, that are in uh, things like Volvo Ocean Race. They have confirmed to us the value of our accurate forecast. Um, and Spire Maritime is positioned as um, a new player and um, maybe a disruptive player when it comes down to open ocean weather data, which is valuable in combination with AIS to analyze vessel performance, to analyze um, bunker fuel costs and CO2 emissions. So beyond the AIS data, we're delivering that. And there is one more thing um, that I wanted to highlight. As Stefan said, there are some limitations in AIS with satellites as well. Um, too many messages come in together at very dense areas. For example, in the area of Singapore to Korea, the South China Sea, it's so dense that uh, you still see holes when the satellites fly over. There's too little kilohertz um, allocated to it. And obviously, as Stefan also explained, there was no satellite in, taken into account when AIS was designed. A solution to that is putting um, AAS receivers on vessels, uh, collecting the data around them once they go through that high traffic zones and then transmit it back every 15 minutes over satellite. That's what we are doing. We call it dynamic AAS, and that is a way to solve the limitations right now on AIS. And you can find more about that. Um, and I think that's what I wanted to say uh, today. Um, I'm sorry for the slides, but we will send that to you later. And I hope to be able to talk to some of you later on. Well, thank you, Simon. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure the slides actually get to, to everyone attending the session so, so they can, uh, um, they can um, look at the slides while replaying the session as the video will be available too. Well, thank you very much for um, this insightful presentation about the value of AIS data. Um, now it will be my pleasure to actually speak about uh, the challenges posed by those IAS data and, and some ways to actually solve those, um, those um, challenges. Uh, so let me, share, let me share my screen. Uh, you, need, you need to unshare your screen actually, Simon, because it says that you're still sharing, even though we, we couldn't see them moving. Oh, okay. let me try that. Yeah, thank you very much. It's it just, it's, it's gone. Okay, so. Can you see my slides? I can, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I'm, 
I'm Matthias Herbert. I'm the CDO and co-founder of Sense. Um, I'm a computer science and telecom engineer, and I've been working with data for a very long time now, or at least when it comes to data, it's, uh, it's quite a long time. Um, I served as a Navy Reserve Officer in the French Hydrographic Service, um, where I became um, involved in, in managing data, um, I mean, geodata. And I've worked with geodata since 1999. Uh, I've worked with data at very large scale because I was in the big, big table service at Google um, around 2008. Um, and in 2013, I founded Sense um, to provide solutions for managing and analyzing uh, what we call sensor data, but basically um, time series data and data that is actually uh, localized. Um, Sense, the company, is the creator of a solution called Warp10. Um, Warp10 is an open source solution, and we like to call it, because we're very proud of what we built, uh, the most advanced time series platform uh, for managing time series and geo time series. So back to AIS. Um, so AIF, you, you know now what it is. So it's the automatic identification system. The idea is to periodically transmit uh, on radio frequencies, the vessel position and some information related to the voyage. So maybe uh, the destination and, and uh, the draw of the vessel. Well, um, some information that, that might be of value for, for the surrounding environment around the, the, the shipping vessels. Um, those data are accessible to, near, to, to nearby receiving stations, but there are also satellites uh, like the one Spire Maritime is actually launching. And as Simon just said, it's a priceless source of information for many verticals. Um, so what is it used for? Well, it's used for many diverse applications already. And, and Stefan said that there, there are probably many more to come, uh, but among the things you can do with that with that data, um, you could track commercial exchanges, you could identify abnormal ship behaviors, you could protect offshore assets like uh, uh, offshore wind farms. And all those uses uh, will at some point in time involve what we like to call an AIS data pipeline, meaning that you will get data from a provider and you will ultimately use that data inside of an application. Um, so how technically and, 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 and really are AIS data transmitted? Well, the stations will transmit messages in slots um, that are part of a, of a one minute frame over radio frequency waves. Um, and those transmissions are then assembled and usually um, passed along the pipeline as what we call NMEA AIS sentences uh, that are representation, textual representation of, of the AIS message. Um, and there are 27 message types that are in use today. Um, there is a provision for 63, if I remember correctly, um, but there are only 27 message types that are, that are used. And, and the most important ones um, are types 1, 2, 3, 18, and 19, which are position reports that basically say, this is ship with this MMSI, and this is where the ship is at, at a given moment. Um, and types five and 24, which are static and voyage information. So giving you information about where the ship um, declared it was going and what its growth is, what its beam is, its length is. Uh, so all that type of information. The other types of messages are, are, are used less often because they're, um, they're for more specific usage. Um, so what technically do, do, do the AIS data uh, look like? Uh, well, when you get data from a provider, um, they will give you data in many different forms. Um, uh, they can give you the raw NMEA messages and it looks like uh, what you can see on that flag, on that slide. So something rather cryptic uh, that will need some decoding. Or they can give you uh, data that is already decoded um, in, in the form of CFZ files or XML files or JSON. Uh, messages, um, or uh, some some of some other ones are more specific for for a given application, but usually that's the most common uh, format that you will find. Um, those data are provided to you as a customer of the data provider, either as files to download or via APIs that that can give you a stream um, of data of real time data, so you, you can get up to date information um, for your for your applications. So what are the challenges um, that those data actually pose? Uh, well, the first one is that uh, 
everybody dreams about using AIS data in their application, and they think that um, things will actually look like uh, what's on the slide. They will take the data, and they will have a nice application making use of that data. Uh, well, that's what I call the ideal pass. The problem is that this ideal pass is not perfect. Uh, and the reason for that is that the data that you will receive, even though the data provider do a great job at actually um, cleansing the data ahead of time, uh, there are still some imperfection in the data that you will receive. Uh, you will get incorrect positions, maybe intentionally uh, due to spoofing or due to bad reception uh, on, on the receiving stations. You will get invalid MMSIs, you will get uh, duplicate MMSIs, uh, and there are some, some uh, very good reasons for that. Some of the transmitters actually only allow you to enter the MMSI once uh, at, at start time, and some people actually make mistake. And instead of buying a new receiver, a new transmitter that can cost a few thousand euros, uh, well, they will live with that bad MMSI in their transmitter. So that's why you get invalid MMSI sometimes or, or duplicate ones. Um, there are other problems. There might be some incorrect timestamps and other good surprises that you discover along the way when you start dealing with that data. So the first challenge that is uh, to actually cleanse the data before you make use of it, because otherwise you will you will get some some bad data to base your, your decision on. Um, the second challenge is that AIS data are massive. Um, there's a popular open source AIS hub service uh, that you can actually um, subscribe to if you have a receiving station. Um, that small service actually pushes roughly 45 million AIS messages per day. Uh, so those 45 million AIS messages per day represent around a little less than five gigabytes per day. Uh, it's a rate of about 500 messages per second, 24 hours a day and seven days a week. Um, that equates to 1.4 billion messages per month or 16 billion per year, um, which kinds of, you know, starts to, to be uh, challenging to, to process. Um, at a higher level, marine traffic says that along all their station, uh, I think marine traffic is going to be cited in all those uh, presentations. You're really the star of that session. Um, so marine traffic says that they process roughly 520 million messages per day. Um, and there are about 200,000 ships actually transmitting um, their position at least once a day um, if, if you look at the planet. So all that data is, is pretty massive. And the second challenge that you're facing is that you must store it before you can actually make use of it. Um, and that's quite challenging. Uh, the third challenge is that, okay, you've stored that data, uh, but what you really wanna do is actually make use of the data. So you need to access that data to make it available to, to your applications. Um, and you need different ways to actually access that data. You need to access the recent data so you can produce a map of, of current locations for your fleet, for example, but you also need to access historical data so you can determine trends or you can see if some situations were actually happened in the past. Um, you need to access that data by ship ID. You need to access that data by time range. You need to access that data by geographical area or any combination of, of those criteria. Uh, so that means that your third challenge is actually to index that data so it can be made available to your applications. Um, and we'll see that this is not a simple, a simple problem. Uh, the next problem uh, that you will be facing is that you want to analyze the data. You want to do um, you want to do analytics, which are totally different than what you would do on on marketing or weblog or retail data. Uh, you don't want to do some slice and dice. Usually, you want to do some more advanced um, processing on the data. For example, um, in if you want to identify fishing activities. So, if you look at the picture on the right, uh, you see tracks of, of of vessels over an area, but among those tracks, um, there are some fishing activities. So there are some, some, some fishing vessels uh, that, that use some fishing gears to actually catch fish in an area. And you might want to analyze that and determine that um, this is the type of fishing activity that we're doing. This is probably the type of fish they were actually catching given the location, the number, the, the time they were at sea and, and the, the pattern of the track on, on the surface of the ocean. So you need to do some advanced analytics. Uh, you might want to compute the environmental impact of shipping. Uh, you want you might want to detect transshipments. 
uh, when you do maritime surveillance to, to detect illegal activities. Um, you might want to perform some geofencing for real-time alerting, or you want to know uh, which way uh, some ships actually um, sailed on, on the surface of the globe. So all that um, are, are kind of complex uh, processing that, that you, will, you will need to do. And you might want to do that in real time or as a batch processing on historical data. So to do that, you will need some powerful analysis tools, um, powerful analysis tools that can actually adapt to those different types of analysis you want to do, and tools that can actually scale um, to the level of the data that you, you want to analyze. Um, and, and when we take those challenges, um, there are, there's a growing list of horror stories that you can tell. Uh, I'm sure every one of us working with AIS data has known uh, some failures of projects that, that um, started working with AIS data and actually bumped into obstacles and, and then moved around first obstacles, but bumped into bigger ones. Um, the recent uh, problems I want to outline is um, at the beginning of September, there was um, um, an AIS hackathon that was organized by the um, United Nations Global Pulse uh, organization. Um, so they gathered about 100 people that were um, to work on, on AIS data provided by UNGP. Um, and, and I've copied a little bit of, of exchanges that happen on, on the Slack about this AIS hackathon with teams complaining that they could not access the data, that retrieving data for 100 ships took about three hours and they couldn't do what they wanted. Uh, and UNGP kept on adding machines. So the clusters for each team grew and grew. Um, and and there were, um, in the end, I think each team actually worked on their own system locally and, and they managed to actually uh, pull out some results. Uh, but that actually showed that dealing with that type of data at scale is kind of problematic. Other horror stories that, that I could tell you about is people are having outrageous cloud bills. Um, they start, you know, they start storing the data and then they start processing it. And then their, their processing job just goes mad and, and, and launches all those processes, consuming all those CPU seconds. Uh, and then you get a, a nice bill for, for that one request that actually never finished. Uh, but you still have to pay your cloud provider. Um, other horror stories involve humongous machines. Uh, we, we talked with some people who actually had to um, rent a machine with 1.5 terabytes of RAMs to actually process the data they need to, to process. Um, and that kind of level of machine actually equates to a, a large bill too. Um, so I said that there are sometimes long running jobs that never succeed, but you never, nevertheless have to pay the, the cloud provider. And in some of the projects that we've seen, we see that the teams uh, managing the infrastructure for, for the data actually grow larger than the actual product teams. Um, so so this, is, this is kind of problematic. And in the meantime, what you actually plan, so making business decision based on the AIS data cannot happen uh, because the data is not available and you cannot pull out the results that you, you expected. So the real pass uh, actually looks more like that. So you have the data on one side, the application on the other one, uh, but then in the middle, you have all those steps, uh, all those, um, those things that you have to do. You cannot escape those things uh, before you can actually make sense of the data. So cleansing, storing, indexing, and being able to perform an anal analysis on, on the data, um, all those things are in the way of your application actually um, seeing the light. And usually what happens is that when you plan your, your, your project using the AIS data, you neglect that part and, and you end up uh, with finding it uh, the, the most costly part of your project where you will spend most of the time um, because you started um, thinking that it was easy to handle those data and you end up um, in, in troubled waters. So hopefully uh, we have technology uh, that is available and, and, and I'm going to go over a few options that you have and, and a few mistakes that you shouldn't make uh, when you want to work with AIS data. Um, so when it comes to cleansing, um, you, you have different approaches. Uh, you could do uh, cleansing uh, before ingesting the data or you could do it post as a post-processing step or you could do it read time uh, before serving the data to your application. Um, 
our recommendation is to actually store the data as you receive it. Um, and the reason for that is that um, whatever effort you put into your cleansing process, um, it could still have faults. It could still uh, be mistakenly cleansing things and, and actually uh, transforming um, good raw data into bad cleanse data. Uh, and if you don't store the raw data on the side, then you will never be able to actually reprocess that data. And if your business decision or if your application actually relies on historical data, then you cannot go back in time and, and have that data available again. Um, the other problem is that cleansing is not simply a matter of looking at every single message. It might be, um, it might be necessary to look at streams of messages. So, so you need a stream processing system that can do buffering and that can look at the data um, in time so you can detect anomalies and see if, if, a, if a ship position, for example, is really off track and you need to get rid of this one. Um, so so this, is, this is all the problems that you have with cleansing. Um, and then after you've cleansed the data, what you have to do is store that data. So you, you need more storage of, uh, available to actually store that, uh, that, um, that clean data that, that you've processed. When it comes to storage, um, many teams uh, usually go the RDBMS uh, or SQL database route. Um, so they, they know those environments and start storing the data in there. And at, at the beginning, everything goes well. Um, they start receiving things and they're really happy. They celebrate that they've just stored 100 million messages and they're really happy. But then after one month, they realize that uh, indices actually grow larger than the actual data. And ingestion actually slows down because those indices actually have to be updated and 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 they start um, seeing some some problems arising so they start partitioning their data or they they have a separate separate database per months uh, or per data sources or they shard it in some way or they go the the no sql database route um, the problem with the no database no sql database route is that it needs careful modeling of data if you want to actually be able to handle trajectories and um, and and um, ais positions in in an efficient way and usually they overlook um, solutions such as time series databases like the one we provide or other options that are really suited suited for that type of uh, of data because they're they're used to handling massive amounts of data um, they have native partitioning by time um, and, and they can provide random access to that data uh, that is stored. Um, another option is to store the data that you receive as files. Um, this is fine if your analysis is done in, in batch, so if you're processing large amounts of data, but if you want to have an interactive processing of that data in your application, uh, then usually that doesn't work very well. Uh, next challenge to address, I've said, is the indexing. Um, the, the problem with indexing AIS data is that it is a spatio-temporal indexing that you must perform. Um, so this is indexing data by time, indexing data by location, and then indexing by metadata, maybe the ID of the ship or maybe some, um, some elements like ship types or, or things like that. Um, so one natural solution that people go to is search engines such as Elasticsearch. Um, but the problem is that at the scale of AIS data, those search engines usually struggle and they cannot cope with the number of positions that they have. Um, so another option is to go to the geo options that you have in your RDBMS. Uh, for example, PostGIS um, as, as extensions for working with, with geo data. Um, the problem with that is that people usually overlook uh, the way those extensions need to be worked. Um, they naively index latitude and longitude instead of indexing uh, the actual data points, I mean the location point uh, that you want to you want to store. And they usually put too much face in, in those OGC compliant functions. So if, if you work with uh, GIS uh, systems in, in RDBMS, then you know there, there are some functions that are ST underscore whatever um, that will provide some some geographic um, functions on top of your data, but unfortunately, uh, the implementation is usually very very uh, poor performance when when you want to apply it at that scale. Uh, other options that you might have is systems like GeoMesa um, that were built for spatial temporal indexing. Uh, unfortunately, 
the infrastructure that you have to set up uh, for those systems is also quite complex for just a few years of data. Um, and for the same reason that time series database are good at, at storing data indexed by time, um, you can also build spatiotemporal indices using time series databases. Um, and, and, and I can send you, um, I can send you an article that does just that, uh, showing you how you can actually create series that are posting list of position to, to index the data at the surface of the, um, of the earth. And then we come to analysis. So data I said uh, needs to be accessible so you can do complex analysis. And you need, uh, you need some filtering capabilities. You need to do advanced manipulation of location data. Um, and you need to perform those analysis in batch mode when you look at historical data, but also in real time and, and in an interactive way on recent data. Um, so the analysis environment that you need um, needs to be compatible with large scale big data um, analysis frameworks. Otherwise you will be incapable of actually analyzing large amounts of data when you look at historical data sets. Um, the other thing to look for is that your, your data scientists need to be able to use those tools. Um, they need to integrate in the tools they're used to. So things like machine learning libraries, machine learning frameworks, um, data science notebooks like Jupyter or Zeppelin. Uh, but your uh, applications also need to be able to trigger those analysis so you can display results in, in your application. And data needs to be available. So real-time data needs to be available so you can get um, things um, in, in, in real time in your app. Um, and, and the visualization option that you have need to be able to cope with large amounts of data because it's, it's pretty common to actually want to look at maybe 5,000 ships uh, at a given moment and see how those move on the surface of the planet. And there again, I can show you, um, I can send you a link to a demo where, where, we, where we do just that. So as takeaways, um, when working with, with AIS data, they're, they're a great source of value for many verticals, for many business. Um, keep in mind that there, there may be some hidden costs associated with using that data. Um, but fortunately, there are great technologies that help um, succeed in, in, in actually putting those data to work. Um, and you might want to consider getting help rather than building from scratch because um, quite often people underestimate how difficult it is to actually set up that AIS pipeline and to handle it at scale as the data actually accumulates. Um, so you should really need uh, to assess where you spend your resources in, on your project. Um, and, and this should be on the business application, not on the infrastructure that you need before uh, the data can actually be made available to your, uh, to your application. That's it. So uh, there's there there's links to, to the demo I, I mentioned uh, a service called Truecy um, that that we have at Sense that is making use of, of our open source technology and that shows you uh, fifty thousand trajectories in real time uh, over the planet. So that that's that's all I have um, now. I will actually uh, introduce uh, Zanis from Marine Traffic. Uh, who will talk about um, how they use AIS data uh, for, for a specific service. And, and Zenis, uh, please enlighten us with, with your presentation. Uh, hi, thank you for the introduction, uh, Matthias. Uh, really looking forward to, to your uh, demo. Um, so, um thank you again thank you uh for the kind words always nice to meet uh, enthusiastic users of the uh the site uh, i'm Janis. i'm a data scientist at uh, marine traffic uh our team has built a great understanding of ais data and uh, as a result many data-driven products Today, we'll be presenting you how we leverage AIS information to produce visual representations of uh, annual shipping traffic. So uh, before we move on to density maps, a uh, uh, quick few words about who we are here at Marine Traffic. We're the leading ship tracking and intelligence uh, platform. We capture uh, shipping movement in a global scale. 
uh, we maintain a comprehensive ship database as well as a very detailed ship position and events records. Complementing this, uh, we also have a very wide collection of maritime related geometry, such as ports, berths, and other areas of special interest. Uh, like uh, you mentioned before, on an average day, we receive at least one transmission from uh, about 220,000 vessels daily. Last time I checked. Uh, which in practice means that we now process 750 million uh, AAS messages daily. Uh, with the end goal of transforming this vast, vast amount of data into actionable intelligence to support decision making for the maritime professionals. Uh, those messages are picked up by an, a network of over 4,600 terrestrial stations that we maintain. This is the largest collection of terrestrial stations in the world. And also for the vessels that are traveling mid-ocean, we augment this picture by satellite uh, AAS. We are the only company that cooperates with all three major satellite AAS providers. And all, all this information is then used to generate events for uh, over 20,000 ports and more than 28,000 berths, as well as uh, those other uh, areas of interest. On top of that, we also use this information to create uh, data-driven products that can be accessed on the platform or mobile application or uh, through API. One of these uh, products is density maps. So what is density maps? Uh, almost everyone should be familiar with the general concept of it. Variations of density maps is everywhere around us. Uh, if you, you can take uh, COVID dashboards, for example, this is something unfortunately most of us are really uh, familiar with these days. So it's basically the product, the product of having a collection of items and applying colors to a map, uh, which are which denote the concentration of those items in a specific area. So for items that we want represented on a map of the earth, that area is its entire surface. So in order to achieve the above statement, one way of going about this is to divide the world using a grid and count how many items there are in its square and then color those squares based on that, that count. Obviously, to get uh, more detailed, the uh, squares need to, to cover a smaller surface and they need to get more and more and more. In order to create, uh, to create a tile map service, uh, what, what is uh, done is that we group these squares, we call them pixels, and we group them in a single tile, which to get a bit technical is just a 512 by 512 uh, pixels image. The actual resolution of pixel, it goes from almost 40,000 square meters when you're at zoom level one, viewing the entire world, all the way down to a resolution of about 76 meters squared uh, when, zoomed in all, when zoomed in all the way to zoom level 10. So in order to, um, this results in what can be called as a point density map. You have events represented by points and you count them. We tried that, it was nice, it was uh, cool. It gave insights, but we felt it uh, lacked somehow. So we decided to up the challenge and create line density maps. So why the line density maps? <clears throat> Uh, in our example of ship positions, point density maps represent every uh, bit of information as a discrete point. However, shipping traffic is a continuous event. The vessel doesn't stop uh, moving in between the pings it sends. So our density maps, they're a product of calculating all vessel tracks, which are produced by connecting consecutive positions. And instead of points, we count how many lines intersect its uh, pixel slash square. Um, we can see in uh, the highlighted areas, for example, that if we were to produce point density maps, we would have gaps in the highlighted areas. Whereas uh, if we are to use lines, these are continuous and they actually depict what the vessel did every single, 
uh, second. So uh, the first step to go from a collection of positions to line density is to connect all vessel positions per ship by using our proprietary ship ID identifier. Because like uh, as Stefan mentioned, uh, there is an issue of uh, transmissions not being locked to a specific uh, vessel or MSI. And you have to put those in temporal order. So we did that and everything was fine. Well, not really. There was a lot of uh, noise in the data still. Uh, like Matthias said, it's just a reminder that the 80-20 rule in the life of a data scientist is not that easy to, to escape, even with a very high quality data set like our positions. So it became evident that we needed to apply some filters to be left only with plausible routes. Uh, for example, this is the, these are the five worst case scenario vessels. These are two research vessels, two fishing vessels, and a tag, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so in order to, to get this under control, we started uh, by applying uh, filters, two types of filters, actually. One was uh, logic filters, uh, which meant we filter by reasonable distance. Uh, because we, if the distance between two consecutive points was too large, the vessel could have moved any which way in between them. So we didn't want to make any assumptions for that. Uh, we also filtered for speed to reach. Uh, two positions should be, a vessel should reach from point A to point B with a reasonable speed, not like 80 knots, for example. And we deleted duplicate or two or positions too close to each other. Um, this this vastly improved the situation, uh, along with some other filtering methods, but it was uh, still not perfect. So we also applied uh, spatial filters. We created a custom land polygons dataset, including a very very detailed coastline. Uh, rivers, lake, uh, all conceivable water bodies that can be navigated by vessels. And then we moved on to delete intersection of ship tracks with those polygons. Uh, the, the reds is the initial data set, even after the logic filtering. And the greens are the, the data set we ended up uh, using after filtering. It's clear that it does have some impact in density. Um, since tracks that are created by two valid points can get dropped with this logic. But what it does is it ensures that only actual water traffic is depicted on the resulting maps. So again, we're not making any assumption on the vessel's tracks when the actual route that connects two points uh, could not have been navigated by a ship or is extremely uh, improbable. So we have a, a crispy Clean, crispy clean view even for inland traffic. Uh, this, uh, for example, is a close-up shot of our uh, native ports of Piraeus before and uh, after filtering. You can notice that um, it's very, very clean around the, uh, the coastline with uh, no uh, invalid routes. Um, on total average, about 4.5% of the data was filtered out. Uh, this, was, this was not evenly distributed throughout the data set. Commercial vessels, they only had an average of 2.4% of positions that were deemed uh, non-valid for our purposes. While other traffic, such as tags and pleasure crafts, had a, they had a higher average, which makes sense. Uh, I'll explain why. Uh, so like, uh, again, Stefan said before, uh, there is many reasons for this type of noise. Uh, number one is AIS spoofing. Uh, I mean, it basically means that multiple vessels, they share a common track since they transmit the same fraudulent details. Uh, we do take some measures, like I mentioned with uh, our proprietary ship ID, we try to assign uh, the correct um, transmissions only to valid ships, but still things slip between the tracks. And another reason is class B transmitters in smaller vessels like tugs and pleasure crafts, etc., which they have a reduced range and frequency of updates, and they are not given a uh, high priority in AIS transmissions. 
Uh, so to recap, we took the, the point pairs, the pairs of consecutive points, we created lines and then we filtered those lines. The next step, it was we passed all these lines through a custom procedure, which basically counts uh, how many lines cross each pixel uh, in our predefined tiles. Multiple lines in the same pixel which belong to the to a single voyage, they only get counted once uh, in order to have a more accurate method. Putting this all together, uh, we transform this into a raster data type, which basically enables us to export these images as colored uh, PNGs in the required folder structure as, um, as uh, required by TileMap service, TileMap service uh, specification so that it can be published on our uh, live maps. In short, every image has a distinct X and Y index that mandates where each image belongs on the map. And putting them all together, it, it looks something like this. Every tile kind of knows where to go. So the process uh, described so far is currently run annually, uh, depicting each year's traffic separately. The procedure is also run individually for predetermined vessel categories that you can see on your uh, left there, based on the vessel type. And in some cases, especially for commercial traffic, uh, based on the size as well. These are, these are then all added together to produce an old traffic view, which uh, looks something like what you see on your screens right now. This is actually our, uh, our new density maps. They're not uh, published yet. So sneak peek for you. Uh, so what uh, what our users do with those? So for starters, for starters, it's the uh, the visual aspect of the product, the colored PNG styles that you can find on a live map, and they can be used for a lot of qualitative purposes, such as, um, for example, to analyze shipping trends. This is an example of an increased uh, LNG traffic on the Northern Passage, which I hear is a big thing lately. Uh, you can uh, analyze the uh, passengers in the GNC, which again, especially in the summer times, it's, um, it's like a fireworks display basically. Uh, my personal favorite, identify specific patterns in places of uh, interest like high traffic uh, anchorages. This is Cape Point in Australia, one of the biggest coal um, ports. And the circles is the anchoring points. Or you can just order some high resolution prints to use as uh, decoration. And this is fishing. Um, it's gorgeous. This is one year of fishing near the uh, Faroe Islands. And I, at least in my humble opinion, it's just mesmerizing to look at. Uh, so what mostly marks uh, this release as Density Maps version 3 is that apart from the uh, beautiful colored PNGs, we are now in a position to offer a complementary collection of datasets uh, derived during the creation uh, process. Uh, we can offer a raster dataset with the raw density values instead of uh, the colors that we chose for each of the categories and for every zoom level from one to 10, which are available either as a GOT for as a PostgreSQL uh, raster, binary raster. Uh, we also offer density values in a tabular form with pixel identifiers, which can be linked to specific locations on the map or used to calculate the actual bounding box they, they refer to. And of course, the, uh, we offer the processed overall vessel tracks in a vector form, the lines, which can be used in various analyses. Uh, one example that comes up uh, really often is location suitability for a variety of means, such as um, wind turbines um, installation, for example. Or simply compare the, the annual shipping volume in an area, how it changes from year to year. Going beyond traffic density, the amount of vessels in a specific uh, place, the data can be fused with other marine traffic information to analyze 
data or produce visualizations or both regarding other metrics. For example, what you're looking at is a very quick and dirty uh, view. I, I, it took me like an hour to make. Uh, it's the, uh, it, the, the colors, the greener they get, they represent the average time spent in each pixel by cape size uh, tankers in the channel area. And you can very easily identify choke points and points where uh, vessels slow down. Other examples like that include the average speed, the number of different destinations declared, the uh, load status, or anything else that uh, you can think of and that is uh, um, on offer on marine traffic. It exists as a, as a metric. Uh, so next steps, uh, we have a few things in mind for the, the future of uh, this product. Uh, we first of all want to maximize the efficiency of generating tiles. Uh, Matthias alluded to the, the vast volumes of data that need, uh, needs processing and the special handling that they need, especially uh, geospatial data, like polygons, etc. Uh, as he described. Uh, they are, uh, they need the indexing, which can get really complicated real fast. So we need to, to look on uh, optimization there. Uh, we're looking to expand time resolution, uh, produce density maps in shorter intervals uh, to get our users a more detailed view of uh, changes in uh, preset uh, time frames and better capture seasonal changes as well. Uh, we aim at having bigger zoom levels in areas of interest, like ports and other high traffic, high interest places. They can benefit from a more detailed view going beyond zoom level 10 and the resolution of 76 meters square. And last but not least, uh, we would really like to be able to support custom vessel groupings. So apart from uh, commercial traffic, tankers and handy sized tankers and those predefined groupings. We want to support the, the, the notion of you giving us our fleet and we're making you some um, visualizations. Uh, that would be all for me. Uh, just want to leave you with a favorite picture of mine. This is uh, Suez North. Uh, please feel free to contact me with uh, any questions or suggestions or your ideas about uh, these data sets. Again, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you, Zanis, for presenting this impressive use case um, and, and looking forward for it to be actually publicly available. Um, our session is now nearing to its end and it's time to listen to Yan, uh, Yan Gishu from EODIN, who will present how they actually use uh, AIS data in their value proposition. Yan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Matthias was the intro, so can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, and now, is it better? Nope, still not seeing your screen. Uh -huh. There we go. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, my name is Yann Gishou, so I am the uh, co-founder you, you, you might just want to put it in... in because we see the whole thing with all the slides and, and uh, um, the, oh. the, the, the next slide. So it's probably better if you change the way it's displayed. Uh, 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 no. um, is it better? Yeah, better. Ah, Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. So my name is Yann Gishu. I'm the CEO of uh, Iodine, a company which was born in 2015. So we are almost five years old. And the um, company, it's a company of eight person, eight, eight people. You can see them on, uh, on this slide. And uh, with, uh, in the team, we have a strong uh, working force uh, related to um, ocean observation and um, uh, remote sensing. So this is our main focus in the company today. And uh, the reason is that we are developing a disruptive technology to monitor surface currents thanks to AIS. So this is what you're going to see on the, on the next movie uh, we're just gonna present. The idea of the technology we are developing is to use 
uh, AIS and ships as in situ sensor of opportunity. Thanks to a machine learning, we are processing, uh, thanks to a machine learning algorithm, we are processing AIS data and we are able to retrieve in real time at a global scale uh, ocean surface currents information. So you should see on the next slide a video. Um, It may like, but uh, you, you will have the, the, the main philosophy of the, of the technology with the video. So you can see some marine traffic of the Algerian coastline in the movie. And uh, thanks to our machine learning, we can retrieve uh, surface current information. So you will see eddies and filaments, uh, which can be revealed thanks to, to AS information and the way we are processing this AS data. So it's just uh, a kind of computation of the drift of the marine traffic and uh, it reveals the, the patterns of the ocean dynamics globally. So this is typically the kind of coverage we can have thanks to 10 days of AS data from Spire or marine traffic, just to, to, to mention some of our providers. And um, uh, so for Eodyne, each dot on this map is a uh, surface current measurement location. So you can see that the coverage is quite uh, quite uh, impressive. And um, just to complete uh, this uh, information on the coverage, here you can see uh, the Gulf Stream in the Atlantic. And this is uh, the results of our machine learning algorithm taking into account uh, sat satellite IS information. So this is this video is a world premiere. This is the very first time we can monitor uh, the Gulf Stream, the speed of the currents, uh, with a high resolution in terms of uh, space and time. So uh, just maybe a quick overview of what he, of, of the technology which was uh, used prior to what Eodyne is doing to monitor surface currents. Uh, the main uh, technology which is used. Uh, to, to monitor surface currents at a, on a global scale from space is called altimetry. This is a um, technology which uses uh, radar satellites and uh, it provides information on the theor theoretical currents, uh, so-called geostrophic currents. So it's not exactly the real current you, uh, mariners can meet in the ocean. And uh, what Yoadine is doing is to use the ships as in situ sensor to reveal um, the surface currents in another way, uh, taking into account the effect of tides, uh, the effect of uh, the currents due to the winds, etc. etc. So it's, it's a very transformative solution, which, which can be as a very important complement to altimetry measurements. So the technology was born in 2014, but uh, we made a lot of validation with several partners, customers uh, during the, the five years, the last five years. So um, we worked with uh, the French Navy, with the IFREMER, with the European Space Agency, and some industrial partners such as Total in different locations. And uh, the results are very good. And we are now building a new standard. I'm convinced we are building a new standard in terms of uh, Ocean surface current monitoring. Um, just a few words maybe about the way it works. Um, so uh, of course we need AIS information which can be provided by uh, coastal receivers and coastal layers uh, on satellite uh, rec receivers. And we are mixing this AIS data with some other Earth observation products such, such as sea surface temperature, chlorophyll concentration products, etc. And thanks to our technology and machine learning, we are mixing all this information to retrieve uh, surface currents at the location of the ship on this measurement, which is uh, at a specific point uh, where the, the ship is, uh, is located. We can build specialized uh, maps uh, thanks to uh, optimal interpolation. So this is what we are doing. And we, then, uh, we are then able to provide to our customers um, maps of surface currents which are uh, available in real time. Uh, so this is a transformative um, solution, but which can be, uh, which, which has been created thanks to uh, the development of uh, e-navigation, IoT, AIS, and big data. So the, that, the data is really uh, the new fuel uh, of the, 
of the economy, I'm convinced uh, of that. And uh, of course, Iodine is, uh, is uh, contributing to the development of uh, this new economy, thanks to e-navigation and all, all the AI stuff we just seen in the previous presentation. Um, so the, a few words about the market we are addressing at Iodine. Um, we are addressing a market which is already existing. Um, uh, as I said earlier, um, surface current was mainly measured thanks to altimetry satellites in the past, and now we are doing, we are enhancing the service which can be uh, developed thanks to uh, altimetry by adding a new uh, way to um, to observe and to measure surface currents thanks to our technology. So we are transforming the many, many services, including um, uh, services uh, related to the markets you can see on this, on this slide. So the shipping industry, the oil and gas sector, the defense sector, and, and some others. And uh, at Eodyne, so we have a technology uh, which enables a lot of things, and we are focusing on a specific service for the shipping industry. Uh, we are developing a, a service we, we call Seaways. So it's a new uh, generation of weather, weather, weather routing service, uh, which is using our capacity to produce real time maps of surface currents to select the best route to avoid, to limit uh, CO2 emissions in the shipping industry. And um, you can see on the next slide, uh, a prototype which have been installed in, on two ships of uh, partners, uh, CMS CGM and Brittany Ferries. And uh, these partners uh, accepted to install uh, iodine devices in their, um, in, on their ships to test seaways and uh, the, the device we installed were able to provide on board ocean surface currents information thanks to our technology which also enable a new way to collect AS information. So this is what you can see on the movie. So thanks to this device we are also developing a network which is can be seen as a complement to satellite AS and the marine traffic coastal receivers etc. Uh, but uh, with rich receivers which are um, installed on board of ships. So it can be seen as a, a, new, a new kind of infrastructure to collect information uh, at sea, AS information. So here you can see some example of what seaways look like today. This is a prototype, but uh, the idea is to use our current map uh, to select the best route uh, and to make, uh, to help the shipping company to save uh, the fuels. So a few words now about uh, perspectives. Um, uh, so as I said a few minutes ago, we are convinced at Eodin that we are building a new standard to monitor surface current thanks to a new technology. We have two ongoing projects uh, which are very um, important for the, the next steps. Uh, this year, one with the French Navy, so-called data flow, and another one with the European St Space Agency, which is involving uh, oil and gas companies such as Total, Shell, and Saipan. So these two projects are related to validation of our data sets for uh, specific needs in the different sector and the oil and gas sector. So uh, we expect to be able to provide some results, uh, I, I think, by the end of 2021. Uh, perspectives again, uh, as I said, the main product we are developing today at Eotine is related to surface currents, but the technology also enables to measure uh, some other parameters such as waves and winds. And this is what you can see on this uh, screen. Uh, here we are in the Pacific area and you can see uh, a low pressure area in red. Uh, which is uh, observed thanks to our technology and uh, the analysis we are doing on AS information. And uh, at the bottom of the image, you can see uh, the same low pressure area, but uh, seen with um, satellites and uh, scatterometry uh, uh, measurements. So this is an, a new product and that will change a lot of things in terms of knowledge of the, the way the atmosphere is moving and it can have a huge impact, impact on, on meteorological model in the future. Uh, just 
to conclude, uh, it will be a short presentation. Um, uh, there are also some other perspectives regarding our technology uh, with a strong social impact, societal impact. Uh, we are convinced that uh, our technology will enable to probably develop the first real-time uh, tsunami detection system. So this is not today, this is in the future, but uh, this will be possible regarding the results we have today with, uh, with our technology. And there are, of course, some other, so, some other uh, activities which can be enhanced thanks to our technology, such as uh, marine debris location and uh, concentration uh, location. Uh, we will be able to enhance uh, weather forecasts, uh, enable, to enable also climate prediction. Just taking the example of the Gulf Stream, thanks to our measurements, we are able to get a very precise information on the, on the stream the speed of the currents and maybe this could help some scientists to to measure uh, the effects of the climate change on the on the on the, on the flow of the of the of the Gulf Stream. So um, I think I, I have presented everything I wanted to to present in a very short time. So I'll provide I give you the floor back, uh, Matthias, to to conclude uh, this session. Well, thank you, Jan. Thank you for for giving us a, a presentation of how you use AIS data and, and, and what you're planning for the future. Um, this session is now over. Uh, we hope you had a great time uh, and that you enjoyed the presentation. Again, I want to thank the speakers for uh, providing that great content and spending time actually presenting those, those different presentations. Um, as I've said before, we will send a few follow-up emails uh, with the contact information for the speakers um, and links to the, the content that was shown uh, when it's going to be available. Uh, do not hesitate to engage in conversation with the speakers. I'm sure they will happily answer any question you might have. Um, and and on, on behalf of Eodin and, and Sense, um, I wish to thank you for attending that session. Uh, it was a great pleasure for us to actually organize it. Um, and we wish you a great CTEC week uh, as it's nearing its end. Um, but uh, please uh, do not hesitate again to engage with the speakers and, and we hope you had a great time, great presentation. Thank you everyone and, and goodbye. <laughs>